Welcome. I'm Patrick Smith, the Chief Executive Officer of Brain Love Health. I'm going to embark today on a series of presentations that walks us through the history of Alzheimer's disease. I wanna talk about the approaches that we've taken, and I wanna talk about some unique experiences I had in this industry as a, as a drug pharmaceutical uh, developer. I also wanna talk about what I believe is the new preference for approaching this devastating disease. Now let me go back just for a second and give you a little background on who I am. I am not an MD, I am not a neuroscientist, I am not a PhD researcher. I'm an individual who got involved in this industry, this project, this research back in 1999, 2000 time frame. During that period, over the last 20 years, I have invested nearly $25 million in today's dollars looking for ways in which we can help with this, with this devastating disease. I am not a physician, as I mentioned, but I want you to realize that you will not find one doctor, one researcher, or one pharmaceutical executive that has put his individual personal financing into this project. It is all funded by outside resources. So when I say that I'm not those things, I do believe I am an authority on the topic. Now I would like to also suggest that there may be times during my discussion and my presentation that I don't use the exact proper vernacular for some of the scientific terms. I am a layman and I will speak in layman terms, but don't let that distract you from the message I'm trying to get across from you, to you. I do know this topic. I know the history of this industry. I know what is working. I know what is not working. And I know what, what can work in the future. So please stay with us. I think you'll find this story fascinating. And I think it's something that can make a significant difference in how we approach Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Now you may have heard in the last week or so, press releases related to the fact that the dominant theory relative to Alzheimer's disease, the beta amyloid cascade theory, the beta amyloid oglomere cascade theory has been faked. That's what I said, These, this research that has recently been published, and it's all over the news, so I suggest you just look into it. The original research that focused on the beta amyloid oglomere theory was faked. So for the past 25 years, our research, our pharmaceutical development pipeline has been filled with information and targets that were fake to begin with. Now I find that extremely disconcerting for many, many reasons, but here's primarily why I'm, it upsets me so much. It upsets me because that was the dominant theory that's prevailed for the last 30 years. That was the predominant research that was being funded by the NIH, by pharmaceutical companies, by the not-for-profit advocacy groups. They funded that specific research, the amyloid theory, because the individuals that ran the upper echelons of the process were like rock stars. They were like um, church leaders. And anybody that brought an alternative theory to the stage was basically eliminated, knocked down, criticized, and their funding, their research, their attempts at trying to look at alternative ways to treat Alzheimer's disease were completely squished. Now that to me is upsetting because I was one of those people that was involved in alternative research areas and actually had some significant clinical data that suggested we were on the right track. 
Now I'm gonna get into all that in part two of the series because I think you need to understand that there have been some breakthrough ideas that had promise, but because the church of amyloid beta squished everybody else's theories, we were unable to pursue many of those things. And it's not just me and my company and my investment that was squished. It was young researchers. It was researchers all over the globe that were seeking funding to do alternative research into other pathways that were squished by the powers that be. And I find that to be extremely disconcerting. I find it to be a travesty of science. And the bottom line is this, the theory that we've been chasing for the last 30 years has never panned out to provide anything that has been helpful in the disease. And the tests and the research and the clinical trials that are currently underway are not going to change that fact. I know exactly what it is they're trying to pursue to treat this disease and nothing in the pipeline is going to satisfy the need to find something that works. Now you might say again, who are you? How do you know this? I'm extremely vested in this project. It's a it's a passion of mine that I've dedicated over 25 years of my life, all my financial resources. It's cost me personal relationships. It's caused me to be rejected by numerous people because of my stance on this topic. But I feel at this point with the revelation that most of the information that we've been dealing with was actually faked I feel vindicated at this point. And I also feel emblazoned with fire and passion to pursue what I believe can be a, the proper way to handle this, this disease that we have no solutions for. We are seeing some breakthroughs. I'm gonna talk about that in session three. And I'm very, very hopeful that we're on the right track relative to that. But let's go back to the beta amyloid theory because I think that's where this all starts. Now keep in mind, the term Alzheimer's disease was coined back in 1906 by a German psychiatrist slash um, pathologist who analyzed the patient and the doctor's name was Eloise Alzheimer's. The doctor analyzed the patient, did an autopsy on a patient he had that died and seemed to have all kinds of dementia and other issues related to her death. When he analyzed her brain, he was able to find these clumps of tissue or these clumps of protein in her brain. It was also affecting her neurons and the connections that the neurons made. And these were easily identifiable. You could see them as little clumps of clay, so to speak, in her brain. And identified that as Alzheimer's disease. Now, nothing was really approached from a research standpoint from 2000 or 1906 up until 1980s is when they began to start doing some serious research on the causes of the problem. But the underlying issue that I want you to get out of this is the initial understanding that it was these plaques and these issues in the neurons, tangles they're called, was the basis for outlining the disease, but also became the basis for what all the researchers were looking at relative to what was the causative factor of the disease. Now, the prevailing thought in the 80s, into the 90s, into the 2000s, into the, the decades 2010, and even in 2020, is it's those clumps of proteins and those tangles in the neurons that are ca the causative factor of Alzheimer's disease. Now, there's been numerous individuals that have said, that might be a downstream event, that maybe it's not, that's not the causative factor, maybe that's an implication of something that's occurring upstream or prior to the clumps occurring. 
But no, nobody wanted to hear that. And there's lots of reasons why they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it for, number one, they like to see things that they can diagnose, identify, and then eliminate. That's the uh, traditional approach of, of modern medicine and mo modern pharmacology. Identify the problem, see if you can create a drug to eliminate that problem, and on we go. The unfortunate thing on that, on that approach is that even when they've been able to eliminate the problems with amyloid plaques, there's never been any increase in cognition or any help for the patient relative to their cognitive capabilities, their ability to live their life in a normal way. So that's the focus that we've been following for the last 30 years, actually maybe for the last 120 years. We've been following, it's the plaques, it's the tangles, that's the problem. So let's fast forward, it's 1980, we start doing serious research. And in the late 80s, they identified the plaques as being made up of these proteins called beta amyloid. Beta amyloid is a very common um, protein that we find in our bodies. It's utilized for various reasons. We don't even know what all the reasons are, but they were able to identify it was beta amyloid. Now we were able to get into the mid 90s and the theories were if we could eliminate the beta amyloid and or eliminate the tangles that are in the neurons that we would find a solution to the problem. So at that time, they start to slice and dice and understand what is the beta amyloid protein plaque made of. And they start to look at ways in which um, they can approach attacking that protein, seeing if they could eliminate it. Now think of beta amyloid plaques and tangles in the brain like this, because I think it's very important to understand. Beta amyloid in itself is a very solid, hard plaque within the brain. But outside of the plaque, there's a myriad of rings, think of it like the rings of Saturn, that surround that plaque. So you have the hard mass inside, and then you have these rings, striated rings, multiple rings that surround the plaque. And if you look at that in an autopsy brain, you'd see the plaque, the rings, you'd see the astrocytes and the glial cells, which are part of a normal acting brain, which act typically as the cleanup crew of debris from the day and keep the brain clear of toxins and other things that need to happen on a daily basis. They surround that beta amyloid plaque. So you have the plaque, you have the rings around the plaque, you have the astrocytes, you have the glial cells. They're all kind of sitting there trying to figure out how to deal with this foreign invader. In addition to that, the plaques are usually bumping up against sick neurons that these neurons have, um, if you understand the physiology of a neuron, there's a nucleus and then there's a, a tail on it called the axion, and then there's dendrites, which basically, um, that basically provide the, the electrical conductivity of the neuron to fire from neuron to neuron to neuron. But inside those, those dendrites and axions, there's these proteins called tau, Tau is what keeps the infrastructure of the neuron functioning properly. Well, they start to break apart and they start to break apart and then they clump together and form these complex little tangles as they're known. And it blocks the ability of the neuron to send a signal from neuron to neuron. So you have the plaques, you have the rings, you have the astrocytes and the glial cells and you have sick neurons with tau tangles in them. And all those things add up to a manifestation of not being able to allow the brain to do what it's supposed to do. And the, my, the primary issue here is that these things form for some reason, we don't know all the reasons, but that's the focus in which pharmacology, research, everybody's trying to figure out how to get rid of those processes in the brain. 
Now, so that was the focus in the late 1900s into the 2000s. I actually entered the industry in, in the year 2000, 2001 with an alternative theory, which I will get into in session two, but let's get back to the issue at hand here. So in 2006, it was theorized that it may not be the amyloid plaque center that we need to target, but we need to target the rings. The rings are called oglomeres. So the theory then evolved into beta amyloid og oglomere cascade, and researchers start to run like lemmings toward that concept. And quite frankly, most of them today are running, still running towards that concept. But here's the issue that occurred. In 2006, there was a paper published that talked about they had found the oglomere. It was called AB56. And that oglomere was the causative, potential causative factor of the downward cascade of Alzheimer's disease. Now, how did they find this and what does that mean? Well, basically at that point, early 2000s, we developed a transgenic mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. These mice were genetically modified to have Alzheimer's disease or get the beta amyloid plaques and everything else involved to cause them to be have the dementia of Alzheimer's disease. So essentially what happened was researchers withdrew the amyloid plaque serum from these transgenic mice, and then they parsed it. They, they did Western blots that are called basically little slices of each little aspect of the amyloid. And then they, they, they stain it in such a way, a Western blot is basically a staining in such a way that you can look at the most minutest particles in a slide in a microscopic slide. And then they take pictures of it. So that's kind of a simplistic way of saying what a Western blot is. But anyway, they, they took this out of these transgenic mice that had Alzheimer's disease, and they took pictures of all the different variations that they saw, and they identified something called AB56, which is an oglomere of beta amyloid. They then took AB56 and injected it in young Alzheimer's or all regular mice and the, the young mice got Alzheimer's disease. So they took it out of the transgenic mice, injected it into the young mice and they got dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Well, they published that paper and they included all their Western blots and all the information associated with the research and that became the holy grail for Alzheimer's research. That singular paper became the point in which everyone said, aha, that's the smoking gun. We have to focus in on the oglomeres, specifically the 56, and then find ways in which we can create antibodies or small molecules that will eliminate that problem. Well, guess what? That was a seminal paper that now I believe has been cited by probably almost 2,000 or more times in subsequent scientific work. But guess what? Nobody's been able to ever duplicate that scientific experiment. Now, let me just mention here for a second, one of the hallmarks of experimentation in scientific research is the reproducibility of other experiments. That is being able to get the same result by a different group of researchers. That's what typically validates that you might be on the right, right track. And a number of researchers did try to reproduce that experiment, but nobody was able to ever find the AB56 oglomere, ever. And they still haven't. No one's ever been able to reproduce that scientific data. Now, if we look forward to essentially what was going on at that time, all the pharmaceutical companies, all the research money, all the NIH funded money, 
all the not-for-profit advocacy groups that were getting funds from all over the world to find the cure for Alzheimer's disease were pouring their funds into this oglomere and antibody research into beta amyloid plaques. And essentially what happened was recently, recently it's been uncovered that the original experiments they did on that, that study of the AB56 was faked. They faked the Western blots. They manipulated the pictures to give them the rings that they needed to see. And essentially for the last 20 years, that misled the whole industry. Misled the whole industry down a path that has gotten us to where we are today, which is nowhere. We're nowhere closer to understanding how to treat this disease from a pharmaceutical standpoint than we were 20 to 25 years ago. Now, why is this so important? It's important because you can unpack what led us to this place you can unpack and understand that it was the myopic focus of the leading researchers in the community that created this, this passion, this, this absolute focus on a theory that has never been proven. Now, why do they do that? Well, I think they do it because A, when you're at the top of the research community, you're a leader. You give talks all over the world. When you go into a medical conference, you have, you have a, a rock star presence among your peers. Oh, Dr. So-and-so is giving a speech at the, at the convention. Oh, Dr. So-and-so just wrote a book. Oh, Dr. So-and-so was on that research paper. It's, it's a very heady experience. Now keep in mind, most people don't go into research to become somebody who's praised and praised and praised with rock star -like, like, like presences. But it can be intoxicating. And that's what happened back in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Many of these researchers, many of these individuals that ran these labs, many of these people that controlled where the funding went for pre subsequent research became rock stars. And that's the tragedy of this whole issue because they suppressed other research, they suppressed younger researchers, they directed the young research teams in their labs where they would focus their time and energy. I recall a circumstance back in the mid 2000s and my niece was going through a PhD program in neuroscience and she was working in a lab. I remember having a discussion with her at that time that I didn't believe that beta amyloid was the causative factor of Alzheimer's disease, that I believed it was an upstream event that then led to the immunological factors that cause the plaques and tangles to become part of the disease. Well, she was incensed that I was a heretic how could I possibly believe that when 99% of the research community believed that amyloid plaques were the problem, that tau fibrillary tangles were the problem? How could I possibly say that? At that moment, I became her crazy uncle. I became that uncle that was basically um, opposed to what everybody was talking about, the group thing, the Bible, the, 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 the thing that held everyone together was beta amyloid, tau fibrillary tangles. That was the predominant thought and anyone that said anything different was looked at like a crack or a crazy person. And that was my niece. Since then, I've had numerous discussions with her about this very topic and I, I'm happy to say that she gets it now, she understands she sees the group think that she was part of, but she's still a brilliant young scientist and I'm sure she's gonna go on and do great things in her life. And I also wanna say that it's, she's validated the fact that her crazy uncle is not as crazy as she thought he, she thought he might have been. 
But let's get back to the point. The point is this. During this period, we've probably had 20 to 25, maybe 30 trials, I don't know the exact number, that targeted beta amyloid either with an antibody or a small molecule therapy. And not one of those clinical trials in human has produced any positive results. Not one of those trials has showed any cognitive support for the downward decline of the disease. Now these trials, in many cases, actually exacerbated the problem, which is peculiar. In many cases, they found when they eliminated the plaques, which they were able to do with these trials, they could eliminate the beta amyloid plaques, but they got, got, got no positive cognition results. In many cases, when they, when they got rid of the beta amyloid plaques, the patients got worse, and in some cases, they actually got encephalitis and infections in their brain, which would suggest that perhaps the beta amyloid is there for a reason. Perhaps it's an immunological response to other things that have driven the process. Now, that's been my stance since 2004, 2005. When we did our own studies at Voyager Pharmaceutical, and that's part two of the series, I'm going to take you through the Voyager experience and the successes we had in looking at this problem. But going back to 2005, I'm on record numerous times saying Beta amyloid is an immunological response to something that occurred upstream, something that occurred early on. Now the data today is starting to suggest that the disease actually starts 20 to 25 years earlier than the symptoms that starts to clog you up and now you start to have these problems. The data also tells us that there are individuals that have beta amyloid plaques in their brain, but they don't get dementia. So there's a lot of confounders in here, and I realize that it's a very complex problem. The brain is extremely complex. Understanding the processes of the brain is complex. But one of the things that's positive that has emerged in the last 20 years is that Alzheimer's disease is made up of multiple issues. It's made up of hormonal issues. It's made up of inflammation. It's made up of oxidative stress. Yes, it does include beta amyloid plaques and tau fibrillary tangles. Those are all part of the disease. But nobody has been able to identify why does the disease start in the first place. If all these things accumulate over time, what is going on that starts the process that creates inflammation, oxidative stress, beta amyloid, tau fibrillary tangles. What are all the, what, what causes it? What's the root cause? And in part three, I'm gonna talk about what is the root cause as we see it. And there's a whole new science emerging that talks about ways in which we can treat the disease from the root cause standpoint. But let me leave this today's session with this thought. And this is part one of a part three or four part series. I've broken it down in a way because I realize people don't have time to sit down and listen to a three to four hour presentation. But I've broken this down to the first part. That is the predominant theory in Alzheimer's disease over the last 20 to five to 30 years has been that beta amyloid and tau fibrillary tangles are the causative factor of Alzheimer's. That dates back to 1906 when Eloise Alzheimer's identified those as in a patient that he found that had the problem. So we've, we've gotten nowhere relative to progressing to a solution. It's unfortunate and as we look at the numbers demographically of this disease continue to increase, we understand that many factors are involved. We understand that it has to do with the aging process, duh. We also understand it has to do with environmental factors, toxins, things of that nature. We also understand it has to do with 
the foods we eat, processed foods, unhealthy foods, foods without nutrients, we realize those are the things that could be the causative agents of this disease. And that's why it's projected to triple over the next 25 years. From a worldwide population today of probably 40 to 50 million individuals with the disease, it's projected to grow to 150 million people in the next 25 years. Those are big numbers. That's a social problem that we can't ignore. And I believe we have solutions and I will come back and talk about the various things that I believe that can help. But today's session is designed on this. The predominant theory for the last 30 years is basically not worked. And in addition to that, the initial data that suggested that was the pathway was faked. How did that happen? Where were all the researchers? Where were all the peer reviewed people that allowed these papers to get published? Well, they weren't there back in 2006. They weren't there throughout the, the, the intervening years between 2006 and 2020. But two years ago, some suspicious researchers started to look into the problem and realized that the Western blots that they were using for this research were faked. They basically colored in the spots that they wanted to make their point. And the rest is history. So thanks for listening today. Again, I am Patrick Smith, the Chief Executive Officer of Brain Love Health, and I have spent 45 years of my life in the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical distribution, pharmaceutical drug, drug development marketplace. And although I'm not an MD, I do know a lot about this topic, so I hope you continue to follow us. You can find us, me, my partner, at brainlovehealth.com. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook, at Brain Love Health. And I hope you have a nice day, and thank you for listening, and look forward to our next session.